I'm Sharon Betters, and this is the Daily Treasure Podcast produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. And we are continuing in our pilgrimage fueled by hope, and we are looking at the life of Jehoshaphat, who is a so like us in so many ways. And we can learn so much from his life about what it means to fall more in love with Jesus and to become one with our Father. And so today's devotional is called, I Can Tell Him Only What My God Says. And today's treasure is from Second Chronicles 18, verse 13. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what my God says, that I will speak. Ahab took the throne of Israel after the death of his father Omri, a very evil, despicably evil man. His rule began during the last years of the reign of King Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. It was no secret that King Ahab followed in the steps of his horrifically evil father and forged his own path with behavior despised by God, as we read in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 through 33. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. And listen, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Have you ever made such a foolish mistake that someone incredulously asked, what were you thinking? If so, what was your response? Maybe you have asked yourself that question. We wish we could ask King Jehoshaphat, what were you thinking? in light of God's blessings and his warnings not to make alliances with God's enemies, it's not hard to imagine him shaking his head in wonder at his own stupidity. He truly made a deal with the devil. But before we judge this king too harshly, dangerous times and fear sometimes lead us to forget God's past faithfulness and tempt us to go outside of God's word to fix things on our own. It's in those times that we need people ahead of us in life's journey to remind us that God did it before, he'll do it again. After a long day of testing and doctor's appointments, I turned my face toward the car window and tried to hide the tears streaming down my cheeks. I was 39 years old, mother of four young children, and diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. Chuck pulled on my hand and said, out with it. What is your greatest worry? I can't do this. I don't want to do this. Doesn't anyone understand? I feel fine. I don't want surgery. I'm terrified of chemotherapy. What if I die? What if it doesn't work? Chuck responded by taking me on a trip down memory lane. Remember when we didn't know how we would get through the last week of the month because we had no money? What did God do then? Remember when people we loved and trusted turned on us with vitriol? What did God do then? Remember when? Each memory reminded me that God had never left us without a way forward. He always met us in the darkest places. While those incidences paled in contrast to a breast cancer diagnosis, Chuck was reminding me, he did it before, he'll do it again. His words soothed me and the tears slowed as I remembered God's presence and power to bring beauty from brokenness. God sent a messenger to Jehoshaphat with a similar message, but to no avail. Jehoshaphat should have known that an alliance with evil King Ahab would not lead to better protection than God's. When Ahab asked Jehoshaphat to join him in battle against Ramoth Gilead, Jehoshaphat agrees to do so, but wants to hear from God's prophets first. Ahab immediately asked 400 men if God would bless this battle. And to a man, they declared that God would give it into the king's hands. Clearly, Jehoshaphat detects that these men respond in fear to Ahab. So he asks for a prophet of the Lord. Ahab's response is almost comical. 
Jehoshaphat should have pulled up stakes and run back to Judah when Ahab told him there was one man they could ask, but that Ahab hated him because, quote, he never prophesies anything good about me. Jehoshaphat, probably trying to show that he really wanted to know God's word on this battle, insists on hearing from this prophet who refused to bow to the king's wishes. Ahab sends for Micaiah, the only prophet who stood for God's truth. The man who brings Micaiah to the kings warns the prophet that he better tow the party line, that 400 prophets have already promised victory to the king. But Micaiah declares, as the Lord lives, what my God says, that I will speak. Micaiah warns the kings that this battle will end in disaster for them. And for his honesty, Ahab imprisons him. Instead of rethinking his sinful alliance with Ahab, Jehoshaphat has moved from complete dependence on God to lead and protect him to rationalize an alliance with a man known for his utter contempt for Jehovah. Micaiah's warning was a grace gift from God, giving him one more opportunity to repent of depending on his own wisdom rather than God's. Instead of remembering God's past faithfulness and trusting him to do it again, he tries to mix a little bit of dependence on God with a heap of dependence on his own wisdom and an evil alliance. They go into battle with Micaiah's warning ringing in their ears. Once more, we have to ask, Jehoshaphat, what were you thinking? Are you starting to see shadows of your own life in Jehoshaphat's? Are you the one asking yourself with disbelief, what was I thinking? How could I have crossed that line? Broken that friendship with gossip, stolen from my boss, torn apart my child's heart with angry screams, hurt my husband by telling him no again and again, or refused to listen to my mentor who tried to help me love my husband and parent my child. I don't know about you, but unexpected crises are not the only cause of ruts and pits along my pilgrimage. My sin takes me on detours I never imagined and caused me to ask with disbelief, Sharon, what were you thinking? This is where we see Jesus in the story of Jehoshaphat. As a popular song goes, God's mercy never gives up on me. And, O oh Lord, if a man so blessed by you could make such a foolish decision, it's likely we can and have, too. What are we thinking when we turn our back on your grace, when our sin takes a messy detour in our pilgrimage toward home? Our only hope is your grace that never gives up on your children. Friends, thanks so much for joining us for Daily Treasure. And I want to take a quick moment to remind you about our Help and Hope podcast that we release every Wednesday. And this week, we are introducing the topic of church hurt in a conversation with Megan Hill, who wrote the book, Sighing on Sunday, When Church Hurts. And I highly, highly recommend this book. I think we've all probably been there where something has happened in church that has hurt us. And I love the title, Sighing on Sunday. We continue to go, but when we sit in that pew or that chair, we take a deep sigh because we're just not exactly sure how we're going to maybe get through the service or maybe why we're even there because of the walls we're building around ourselves so that we don't get hurt again. Well, in this conversation, uh, Megan talks about those things and she talks about why church hurt can be so devastating, the root of church hurt, people in the scriptures who have experienced church hurt and how they responded, the priceless gift of community, and reasons to pursue life in a local church even when it hurts. Megan gently leads wounded people on a pathway to peace as she encourages us to explore the source of our struggles, find ways to express our sorrow, and consider wise actions to take. Friends, others have struggled as well and found hope there's hope for you too. So make sure you go to helpandhopenow.org. That's helpandhopenow.org and click the Help and Hope link and look for my conversation with Megan Hill when church hurts. Thanks so much for joining us and I look forward to being with you tomorrow.